Hello, friends. I'm Professor Filip Kovacevic, and this is the sixth edition of the Russian Newspapers Monitor. Dear friends, our Kickstarter campaign is still going on. Please help us make our quality programming possible. Where else can you get an objective and non-partisan presentation of the Russian newspaper articles and the Russian politics in general, except here at Newsbud? Support our work so that we can do even more programs for you, the viewers. Our first article for today comes from the Rasiskaya Gazeta, the Russian government-owned newspaper. Let's begin with the edition for November 8, 2016. Of course, the focus is on the U.S. elections. This edition was published on the day of voting, and so the final outcome was still unknown. As I pointed out, in one of the previous editions of the Russian Newspapers Monitor, most Russians preferred the victory of Donald Trump. They thought that his victory would lead to the improvement in the U.S.-Russia relations. Now, when we know that he got elected, we will follow closely to see what happens. The article in question deals with economics. It is an opinion piece by Yakov Mirkin, a well-known Russian economist, and it examines how the U.S. elections will influence the Russian economy. The title of the article is The Dollar Loves the Democrats. Mirkin begins by explaining that the United States holds one-third of the world's financial wealth and 24.5% of the global GDP. When the United States economy is growing, the rest of the world follows on the growth path. When the United States economy is declining, this trend is also reflected globally. Mirkin notes that it is on the Wall Street and in London City that the prices are decided for the main Russian exports, oil, natural gas, precious and other metals, and so on. In other words, the fate of Russia depends on what goes on there. He states that the last six-year growth of the U.S. economy, officially from 1.6 to 2.6 percent a year, together with the growth of the Chinese economy, 7 to 10 percent a year, brought the world out of the 2007-2008 economic crisis. According to Mirkin, it is this growth that enables the continued demand for the Russian raw materials, especially by China. In his opinion, the U.S. economic policy of quantitative easing, which involved the extensive intervention of the Federal Reserves into the economy, helped this positive scenario come about. In addition, Mirkin tries to define the features of the U.S. economic success because he believes that Russia must learn from its competitors. First, he says, the U.S. promotes and rewards innovation, talent, and expertise. Secondly, the United States behaves egotistically and does everything to further its own benefits. It does not copy anybody, but resolutely forges ahead. Lastly, the U.S. government minimally regulates the dealings of business. Mirkin thinks that Russia must do all these things if it is to compete successfully with the United States on the global economic arena. Mirkin also wants to dispel what he considers a myth of the U.S. bankruptcy. He states that the current U.S. debt, which, according to the International Monetary Fund, is 105% of the GDP, is not all that big for the country of the U.S. size and importance. Japan's debt, for instance, is 238% of the GDP. Also, 
the United States debt is in its own currency, the dollar, which it can print without asking any other country for permission. Moreover, most of the United States debt is held by domestic investors, which means that the debt is essentially the matter of the U.S. domestic policy. Mirkin points out that certain clear economic cycles could be discerned in the U.S. economy since the 1980s. When the Republicans were in power, the dollar was weaker and the economic growth was declining. With the Democrats, it was the opposite. There was a lot of growth, and as a result, the dollar got stronger. And so, according to Mirkin, if we take into consideration these cycles, the election of a Republican for president would be better for the Russian economy. The dollar would get weaker and the prices of raw materials would rise. The price of oil would quickly rise to $80 per barrel. Such was the case in the early 2000s. However, Mirkin also states that it is still uncertain what will happen this time around. Both Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump talked about pushing the growth of the U.S. economy even stronger. It is true that they planned to use different economic policies, but the stated objective was the same. And the bigger the U.S. growth, the stronger the dollar would be. Not a very good news for those depending on the sale of raw materials, such as Russia. In other words, in terms of the economic impact on Russia, the two candidates may not be all that different after all. In conclusion, Mirkin compares the present U.S. economic policies with those being implemented in Russia at this time. He claims that in order for the Russian economy to grow, it must more closely follow this model. According to Mirkin, Russia must cut taxes and administrative regulations and stimulate more private investment and innovation. In my opinion, Mirkin is a typical representative of the liberal economic wing in Russia, led by the Russian Prime Minister Dmitry Medvedev. However, it appears that Medvedev is quickly losing favor with Putin. As I wrote in my new Newsbud article on the spy war in the Balkans, his visit to Serbia was canceled, and Nikolai Patrushev came instead of him. Patrushev is at this time the secretary of the Russian National Security Council. He has been one of the closest Putin's allies for almost two decades, and he succeeded Putin as the head of the Russian Domestic Intelligence Agency, the FSB. In fact, I think, and I am probably the first among the English-speaking analysts to say this publicly, I think that Nikolai Patrushev might soon become the prime minister of Russia. In this case, the liberals, such as Mirkin, would lose considerable power, and their preferred strategy of emulating the United States economic model would be quickly abandoned. In the second article for this week, we continue with economic issues. Let's look at the front page of Izvestia, the moderate pro-government newspaper, the edition for November 9, 2016. There is an article with the title, Russia proposed to the Commonwealth of independent states, the mir. The mir, which in Russian means both peace and the world, stands in this particular case for the unified banking system. The article reports that the setting up of a unified banking system on the territory of the Commonwealth of Independent States, which includes nine former Soviet republics as full members, and two as associate members. That is, all except Georgia, Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania. 
that this unified banking system is only several months away. The representatives of Russia, Armenia, Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, Belarus, and Tajikistan gave a green light for this decision at a recent meeting in Yerevan. This means that the integration processes in Eurasia have begun to follow the pattern of the European Union integration some decades ago. The first step is to establish the system of credit cards, which can be used in all CIS members. So far, this joint system exists only in Belarus and Russia. This will require changes in the existing laws, as well as a much closer integration among the central banks. It is also connected to other integrative processes in the areas of currency exchange, tariff, and tax policies. In my opinion, the integration of Eurasian economies has really picked up the steam in the last two years. It is clear that there is a political impetus for this, which is coming from Russia, and is directly driven by the hostile attitudes of the United States and the European Union. Once China gets involved, and this will probably happen in the next two years, we will quickly see Eurasia becoming the world's most powerful economic bloc. The nightmare of Henry Kissinger and Zbigniew Brzezinski will become reality. Now from the economy, let's switch to geopolitics. And let's look at the Nezavisimaya Gazeta, the middle-of-the-road newspaper, the edition of November 9, 2016. In the middle of the front page, there is an article with the title, Killed Near Mosul. And there is a photo that shows a captured Islamic State tank and a great deal of tank ammunition. The subtitle states that the U.S. military had its first casualties in the attack on the Islamic State positions in Mosul. The article begins by saying that it was expected that the capture of Mosul would be a gift by the U.S. military for the new U.S. president. However, it turned out that the blitzkrieg announced by the Pentagon did not materialize. And not only that, but now, there are the first casualties among the U.S. troops. According to the anonymous sources in the Russian military intelligence structures, already during the first weeks on the attack on Mosul, the United States lost 16 soldiers, while 27 were wounded. Among them, two members of the special forces lost their lives due to the so-called friendly fire. They were killed in the bombing raid by the United States B-52H on the positions of the Islamic State in the suburbs of Mosul. According to the article, the U.S. allies in the attack on Mosul suffered even more casualties. The Kurds, for instance, lost about 300 soldiers. The official Baghdad claims that the Iraqi army lost only 90. However, Independent observers have different figures. They are talking about hundreds of dead and up to 1,000 wounded. The media website al Mak claims that so far in the battle for Mosul, 819 soldiers in the U.S.-led coalition lost their lives. Even though, according to the official sources, the coalition numbers more than 100,000 soldiers, he has not been able to take Mosul so far. According to the article, it is not that the numbers of the Islamic State fighters are very big. There are only about five to 6,000 militants there. It is that the Islamic State has been preparing the defense of Mosul for at least two years. There are many defensive rings and underground canals built under the city. In addition, according to the article, the militants 
have a lot of fighting experience. And some of them are mercenaries who have been trained by the CIA in its various covert campaigns to destabilize the so-called rogue states in the Middle East. The article claims that the attack on Mosul went wrong from the beginning. There have been many disagreements within the heterogeneous coalition put together hastily by the Pentagon. It appears now that the Kurds have refused to advance any further and are building the trenches on the territory they have taken over so far. In addition, the military technology used has shown various weaknesses. The US already lost nine tanks, including six new Abrams tanks and about 50 armored carriers. According to the article, the new Abrams tanks have been shown to perform poorly as they are easily set on fire. The article claims that the new Russian T-90 tanks have been much more successful in the Middle Eastern desert conditions. In connection to this, the article states that the Iraqi army might begin using some Russian weapons, especially the heavy artillery systems TOS-1A and even the artillery systems Grad that the Russians were supposed to deliver to Iraq according to the agreement signed in 2014. In order to paint a more balanced picture, the article knows that the Russian army also had casualties in the Middle East. According to the official reports, 20 Russian soldiers have been killed so far in Syria. However, the losses may be bigger as they do not include the unreported special forces and intelligence operatives who work undercover in the Islamic State controlled areas. The article also asserts that it is very likely that the US private military companies also have their own forces fighting in Mosul. There is likely to be a loss of life among them too. According to the New York Times data cited in the article, only in recent months, 58 private military contractors got killed in Iraq and 27 in Syria. Altogether, from January 2009 until March 2016, that is the first seven years of the Obama presidency, 1,301 U.S. soldiers and 1,540 military contractors lost their lives in Iraq and Afghanistan. In my opinion, this article offers a credible critique of the U.S. involvement in the Middle East. If the future U.S. interventions are not based on negotiating and agreeing on the wider coalition, including Russia and China, then the fate of an ordinary U.S. soldier or a U.S. military contractor in Iraq, in Syria, and in Afghanistan is not likely to improve anytime soon. Also note that the information on the U.S. casualties has not been reported by any U.S. media organization or confirmed by the U.S. government. Let's stay a little bit longer with the Nezavisimaya Gazeta and look at the front page for the edition of November 10, 2016. There is a big color photo of Trump on the front page and the title is Trump prevailed over the law of political gravity. The article discusses how it was possible for Trump to win even though so many in the political intelligence and media establishment were against him. This article does not cover any new ground that is not already familiar to the US audience. So I will focus on another article also on the front page. It is right below the article on Trump and the title is Shoigu 
is strengthening defense, notwithstanding budget problems. The reference is, of course, to the Russian defense minister, Sergei Shoigu, and his efforts to rapidly build up the Russian military. The subtitle states that the Ministry of Defense is increasing the spending on the professionalization of the military, despite the budgetary cuts. In fact, it appears that the spending on the military will increase in order to make it less dependent on mandatory draftees. According to the sources contacted by the newspaper, the number of those under a professional contract in the Russian army and navy will increase to 425,000 by the end of 2018. The article also states that the Russian parliament, the Duma, is working on several changes in the laws that govern the national defense. In one of the changes, the leadership of the Russian regions and municipalities will be made responsible for military mobilization in case of the state of emergency. In other words, the system is being made more efficient. Another change in the existing laws establishes the legal steps leading to the militaries taking control of the municipal and regional governments in the case of the enemy attack on the Russian territory. This means that the Russians are taking seriously the possibility of NATO invasion. Also, according to the drafts being considered in the Duma at this time, by the end of 2018, in the Russian military, there are supposed to be 220,000 officers, 50,000 junior, warrant, and non-commissioned officers, 425,000 contract soldiers, and 300,000 draftees. This means that in two years, 70% of the Russian military is projected to be professional soldiers. In contrast, in the United States, the military draft was abolished in the 1970s, and all soldiers are professionals. Obviously, in order to make all this possible in Russia, the budgetary expenses for the military must be increased. The article concludes by citing the Russian government document, which states that, quote, the Russian military today represents one of the most reliable government institutions being able to defend Russia and its people, no matter who holds the reins of political power. In my opinion, this article sends a clear message to the Russian audience and to the world at large that the Russians are seriously preparing their country for a future military confrontation with the West. Of course, as we know, the Russian leadership has been willing to give peace a chance and extend the hand of cooperation to other great powers, including the United States. However, Putin and Shoigu are also working around the clock to get the country ready for potential alternative scenarios. Lastly today, we'll make a full circle and come back to the Rasiskaya Gazeta, the Russian government-owned newspaper we started with. We will look at the edition for November 10, 2016. Just like in the Nezavisimaya Gazeta, the most prominent article on the front page is on the victory of Donald Trump. However, there is no photo of Donald Trump. The photo chosen by the editors is that of a seriously looking Trump supporter in New York City. In my opinion, the choice of this photo is very significant. I think that the message that it is sending is that now that he got elected, Trump must not allow himself to be swallowed up by the established political class and their hegemonic foreign policy, and he must remain faithful 
to what he promised to his voters. The Russians already know that this will be extremely difficult. It will require no less than a revolution in the U.S. foreign policy thinking. The CFR, the Atlantic Council, the NATO-controlled media, and the rest of the globalist crowd will do everything they can to either co-opt, or if that fails, to subvert Trump. The fight is just beginning, and Putin knows that. Also, there is another article on the front page of this edition that is very significant for the future of the Russian relations with the West. The title is Dilettanti.net, and the subtitle explains that the Russian and foreign history experts will work together against the manipulations with historical facts. The article explains that this summer, the Committee on International Affairs within the Russian Historical Society was formed in Moscow. The aim of this committee, which includes noted historians from France, from Austria, and China, is to make sure that Russian history is presented in an objective and truthful way outside of Russia. Keep in mind that the current head of the Russian Historical Society is Sergei Narishkin, who was the Speaker of the Russian Parliament and recently became the chief of the SVR, the Russian External Intelligence Agency, the Russian equivalent of the CIA. I wrote about his appointment in the article for Newsbot entitled, Why did the Russian spies get a new chief? Now, this article in the Rasiskaya Gazeta includes the interview with the historian Alexander Chubarian, who is a distinguished member of the Russian Academy of Science. Chubarian emphasizes the importance of this international committee at the time when the Russian history is being presented in a very negative, revisionist way by the politicians and experts in Europe, especially in Ukraine, in Poland, and the Baltic states, as well as by their academic and political allies in the United States and the United Kingdom. According to Chubarian, the committee will provide an international platform to respond to the manipulations and fabrications of this kind. In this respect, the old debates on the identity of Russia and its relations to Europe have come to the fore again. Is Russia a European or a Eurasian state? Should it turn to the West or to the East? Is it its own unique civilization? What is the mission of Russia in the world, if any? Is Russia really the third Rome supposed to bring spiritual salvation to humanity? All of these are the burning questions of the day, and the fate of the world depends on finding answers in a respectful, tolerant, and peaceful manner. Dear friends, this is all for today. Please support Newsbot on Kickstarter. Be cool and stay cool until the next edition of the Russian Newspapers Monitor. Thank you. Last June, a new media platform was introduced, and the people spoke, making Newsbud the number one most successful journalism campaign in Kickstarter history. Leading the Newsbud team with nearly two decades of a proven track record is award-winning activist, publisher, and author Sabelle Edmonds. Hi, I'm Sabelle Edmonds, the founder and editor of Newsbud, a 100% people-funded media with integrity. About a year ago, 
As I said about creating the objectives of this one-of-his-kind media project, the establishment and establishment-oriented people called it a mission impossible. According to them, a media model 100% free of corporate advertisement, a media entity without backing from foundation sugar daddies, a news organization that refrained from subscribing to partisan politics, the red or blue pill, was an impossible dream. Last June, thanks to you, thanks only to you, not only did we make the phase one of this media project possible, but with your backing, we also made it the most successful and most funded Kickstarter journalism project of all time. Everything we have accomplished has been made possible by you. Newsbud is building a one-of-a-kind multimedia news platform only made possible by you, the people. No corporate advertisers, no money from the foundations, and no government ties. We are the only 100% people-funded multimedia news source out there. Your support is needed. This allows Newsbud to recruit the best and the brightest from around the world to give you the news and analysis you won't find anywhere else. The Newsbud team as a whole speaks seven different languages. This unique quality allows Newsbud to offer you unmatched geopolitical news and analysis from Sibel Edmonds, Christoph Yerman, and Philip Kovacevic of Russian Newspaper Monitor. Be a part of the movement for making possible the new democratic independent media on the internet. Support Newsbud. We have writers and analysts who served in the military, providing expert exposés on the military industrial complex, like Christian Sorensen in his monthly Department of Defense reports, and Newsbud analyst Eric Moshe. Newsbud's work is shaping up to make big dents in the artificial armor of corporate media conglomerates, who run sanitized news programs and rarely show every side of the story when it comes to world events and analyses. However, with this breakthrough platform, we've got the potential to, to become a treasure trove of meaningful exposés, holding powerful people and organizations accountable and tracking international fervor as it unfolds. If you are looking for a well-organized effort characterized by integrity, valuable insights, and admirable motives, look no further. Seasoned investigative researcher, writer, editor, and producer of the Geopolitical Report, Kurt Nimmo. Newsbud is an important alternative to media produced by the corporate propaganda matrix in the national security state. Every week, we produce content that you won't find covered by establishment media outlets that claim to offer investigative journalism. Please consider joining us in making Newsbud the number one most funded Kickstarter journalism project of all time. People need to know what's really going on in the world, and Newsbud is working toward that goal. Thanks for your support. Newsbud executive producer and editor Spiro Scoris. We are extremely grateful and humbled from the overwhelming support that we received during our initial campaign. Phase one allowed Newsbud to establish our foundation, which is key for any operation. In phase two, we intend to build upon that foundation and expand our operation. Having access to the needed resources will ensure that Newsbud will remain a leader and trendsetter in the alternative media and beyond. Support independent media. Go to kickstarter.com today. We have a long way to go, not only to continue, but to expand, become more effective and grow together. We are only answerable to you and you are the only ones who can keep Newsbud in existence and allow it to go much further in pursuit of journalism with integrity. Please join us. Join the Newsbud movement by kindly and generously pledging towards this 100% people-funded media with integrity. We have accomplished a lot, but this is only the beginning. And that is my promise to you.